Good morning. I will get to why I have some shoes in a second. <laughs> if you'd like to start turning to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 7. Last week, kind of dealt with some things about the church, kind of more of an introduction to mainly the importance of the church. And there's one thing through the course of the lesson last week that really stuck in my mind, and that's Christ being over the church, Christ being the head of the church, and how important it is that we understand that he is in that position and no one else, that he is the one who has the authority to set the rules, to set the guidelines, and to be the one who says that you are in or that you are out. He has that authority. Now, what I am very thankful of, because I have recognized that I myself cannot fully understand God. I can't fully understand his spiritual will for me without the use of what we see in the gospel accounts. Over and over, Jesus used parables for us to understand what he was meaning. And one of the greatest examples that I'm aware of is found here in Matthew chapter 7. There was a reason he used miracles. Jesus was not an individual who just done things to do things. he done them for a purpose. So when he would use parables and it was known, he would say Jesus spoke in parables. They recognized that it was a parable. They recognized that Jesus was doing this for a reason. Now, look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. We know the parable. We know the parable of the wise man who builds his house upon the rock, the foolish man who builds his house upon the sand. But why would Jesus have the saying of that? Why couldn't Jesus just say, you're either wise or you're a fool? That's really all he needed to say, but to get his point across, he had to use something for the Israelites, for the Jews, to be able to say, oh, that makes sense. Because Jesus is new to the scene. Jesus is not someone who's been there for years and years and years. And his philosophy is not like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those that are, that are in the synagogues. Jesus' philosophy is in line with John the Baptist. And where is John the Baptist? Well, he was in prison. So you can see where that got him. So Jesus used things to his advantage. So he used the physical things of this life to explain to us what he means for the spiritual, a parable, using the physical to explain the spiritual. Every parable is describing something in the spiritual, but he uses something physical to get to that point. Now, Colossians chapter 1, Colossians the first chapter. So if we want to understand... And to know God better, we need, to phys- we need to figure out the physical. Because he has rooted many things in this physical life so that we may understand the spiritual application. Uh, when Jesus, or John the Baptist was talking about Jesus, they asked him, are you not, I'm kind of uh, summing it up here, but they asked John the Baptist, are you not concerned about Jesus? And his disciples baptizing all these people. And John was of no concern. And, and how did he style his relationship with Jesus? He styled it in a way that he was the best man and Jesus was the bridegroom and the kingdom was the bride. So how did he style the kingdom? Like a marriage. And that he was the one right next to the bride. And the bridegroom, he was the best man of the wedding. That's the way John the Baptist described the relationship to Jesus and his kingdom. He styled it like a Now, can we understand a marriage? Yeah. I, I, I honestly can't understand a kingdom because I've never been part of a physical kingdom. The United States is not a kingdom. Now, if we were raised some odd years ago over in the European nations, we would know what a kingdom was with a king and with a queen. So Jesus used... This physical relationship between, or John did, between Jesus and the, the church. Uh, 
a bride and a bridegroom, and he was the best man. Now look at First Corinthians, or First Corinthians, Colossians chapter one, and look down here at verse fifteen. One thing we always need to know and need to understand is where we, you know, where we fall in line in all this. And I'll get to why I have a pair of my shoes and a pair of my wife's shoes in just a moment. Let's look here at Colossians 1, and we'll start here in verse 15. He, being Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So Jesus is the preeminent one. He, he is the most important thing that could ever happen anywhere in this universe. Without Jesus, none of this would even be possible. Jesus uh, was the creator and the sustainer of, of all things. So, for by him, all things were created. That's why he's important. You wouldn't have your life. You wouldn't have your family. You wouldn't have your kids. You wouldn't have your dog, whatever it may be you cherish so much. You wouldn't have your house. You wouldn't have your job. You wouldn't have this beauty to enjoy without Jesus. Jesus is the creator of all things. For by him all things were created that were in the heavens and that were on the earth, visible and invisible, whether the thrones or dominions and principalities of power. So that's why we don't get wrapped up in the powers of this world, the authorities of this world, because who is over them? Who created them? Jesus did. So don't, that's one area I hope nobody gets lost in is the, the authorities and powers of this world. Be wrapped up and be uh, only concerned about who is actually in control, and that is God. And trust that his plan and his purpose will, will come to pass. And so whether it's visible, invisible, whether it's dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, and that body being the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that is all things in him. He may have the preeminence. Jesus, out of all things that you can possibly fathom, Jesus is over. He is not only just head of the church, he is head over all creation. The things that we can see and the things that we cannot see. There are some things in this universe that we have not seen. Maybe one day we will see. And we'll get our telescope over there or we'll get our probe way off over there. And it's going to be the same logic. God is over that too. Maybe there's some lost civilization out in the universe. I don't know. I can't say yes or no. Maybe there is. Well, guess who's over them? <laughs> God is. So wherever you go, whether no matter what you're trying to accomplish, Jesus is over it all. Now, you may be wondering why it's tough on some occasions to get people to want to consider the gospel to be part of their lives. I understand that it's not an easy task. It's never been easy. But I believe it's getting harder and harder. Compared to the stories I've heard about the, the last generation, the generation before, it, it, from their eyes it's getting harder to teach people my age and younger the gospel. And I want to throw an idea to rack around your brains that one of the issues may be is the lack of respect for those in authority. And I'm going to deal first with husbands and wives, and then I'm going to deal with children. Okay, so here I have my wife's new workout shoe. Here I have mine. <laughs> Big difference, right? These shoes do two different things. Because I'm not dealing with the fact that one's a trainer and one's a basketball shoe. And you would think that, that the other one would be my wife's because of the color, but it's not. I like bright colors when I play basketball. So, I mean, this is pretty drastic. I mean, they, my wife can, can go buy children's shoes to save money if she wanted to because she can fit in them. I cannot. Most of the time I have to order them or I have to find what's way in the back and it's got dust all over it. And Ty, I know Ty has this problem too. It's, it's tough to have big feet. So when I'm looking 
at my wife. My wife looks at me. We understand that we have two completely different roles. But our roles are rooted in the same thing. That should be faithful to God, be faithful to each other, and raise our kids in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. We understand that. Those are the similarities we have. But when it comes to our actual lives, we are different. My life is not her life, and her life is not mine. Her abilities, I don't have. I can't bring life. I'm only part of the process. My wife literally brings life into the world. I can't do that. No matter how many men say that they are women, it, they can never do it. They can't because women are women and men are men. Women ought not to try to be men and men should not try to be women. If God wanted you to be a woman, guess what you would have came out of the womb as? A woman. Now you can be as feminine, you can be as masculine as you want, you will never be the opposite role. It don't matter how many surgeries, it is in your DNA, you are that which you were born. Accept it or not, I don't care. <laughs> the, the biological fact will stay the same. You're a man or you're a woman. And here's what proves it. This is a big difference between a man and a woman. My wife walks a different path than I do. She will raise my kids in a manner that I probably can't raise them because women have certain touches. They have certain ways about them. A man has a certain way and a certain touch about them. A man will normally be a little more physical and they'll be a little bit more stern. But a woman can be very stern, but the way she does it most of the time has a better outcome. Just looking at how women are with children. So let's turn to the book of Ephesians. I think one of the biggest problems we have is the lacking of respect for authority. Now, authority is a word that a lot of people don't want to hear. Who really wants to hear that someone has leadership over your life? Now, that's a better word, leadership. Leadership sounds way better than authority, but the one who is in charge of leading has what? Has the authority, is the one in charge. Now, you can go about this many different ways. There's a way that's profitable, and there's a way that's going to lead to, uh, definitely to a bad ending. So Ephesians teaches us something about the church. And guess how he styles the church? Lack of marriage. Why? Because we can do what? We can understand that. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Okay, so we can understand that. If you are practicing submission to your husband, do you think you're going to have a good submissive state with God? Yes, you will, because that's the comparison. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now, there's, there's a way to look at this that is wrong. And, and, it, and it's the way that a lot of young women may look at this. And I encourage you to relook at it. Do not look at texts like this as the man is some big macho man and he's pointing the finger telling you to, to do whatever it is he wants you to do. If you think that's how this is, you need to look at the way me and my wife are. My wife understands that I play a role in the family, but I'm not doing this all the time. I'm not making commands to say, you better go in there and make me a ham and cheese sandwich now. There are men that look at this and say, that's my role. I am the one that has to tell her to do whatever it is. I don't believe that because my wife is still a free-thinking human being. She just happens to be my wife. And I happen to have a role within the family. And how can I understand this role? Well, who do I look at? I look at Christ, who is head of the church. So if I'm practicing being a leader being head over my wife, am I going to come to a point where I can accept Jesus being my head better? 1 Corinthians chapter 11 teaches us, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3 teaches us that Christ is head of man, just as man is head of the woman. So I have to also learn and understand that I am in submissiveness, in subjection to Christ. That I am not the one who has no one above them. 
I have someone that leads me and guides me so that I can lead the one who is trusting in me, being my wife. I don't lead anybody else's wife. <laughs> I don't. If I do, it's just in a, re- it's in a state like this where we're just teaching and preaching the gospel. But I'm not going into another person's house and leading their wife. My wife is not going into another man's house and being submissive to them. Now, if we are invited over to someone's house and the man of the house asks my wife to do something, do you think she's going to do it? Yes. It's being respectful. It's being uh, thankful for being invited uh, as a guest. But she's not going to be submissive like she would to me. We are submissive and we lead our own husbands. We are submissive uh, uh, and, and our own wives. We, it's, it's that oneness. It's that respect and mutual respect that I think has completely been dis regarded. Now, I don't think I'd have to ask if this is true, but there are many homes, many new marriages where this is the opposite. Where, and I, and I watch it all the time. Trust me, I see it. I see it every Sunday. And I don't know what happened to me and my wife. We laugh about it. It's funny, but it's not that funny. It's actually serious. And I've seen, I've been in a home and I've witnessed homes where the woman is the head of the house. And we don't have to use that terminology. I mean, a woman really, that's, that's her domain anyway. But a woman's role is not to be head over the family. And, and like I said, you can accept it or not. I mean, it's your choice. But if you want to, to understand God more, you have to understand his desires for mankind. And part of that desire is to function the home just like the church is functioned. Because the more we understand that and the more we practice that, the better we're going to understand Christ and his church. Because he styles it in something that we can understand. And that is the physical. Now look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7. Something I want you to to understand because I think a lot of people, uh, especially my age and younger, will look at me like I'm like like I'm some master and my wife is some slave. And I think that it's something that will uh, kind of steer away young people to come to church and, and come to the gospel. But if you're trying to Please, God, if that's your focus, because if that's not your focus, you won't listen to anything I'd have to say anyway. But if your focus is, hey, I really want to please, I really want to understand what God wants from me, you have to be able to open yourself up completely. And you can't shut off any area because I can guarantee you that you will probably find something offensive in here. Because Being offensive is something that takes place differently throughout every generation. You go back some generation, they wouldn't be offended by the things that we're offended today. So in in 30 years from now, the the state of offense may be different, different things that happens. So I can guarantee you that if you're one that says, I kind of want to come to Christ, I need to figure out how, well, first thing is you're going to have to open up and understand that there are going to be some things in here that will make you feel uncomfortable. There are going to be some things in here that you would never thought that God would ask you to do. But I can guarantee you that he is not going to ask you to do something of his desire that you could not fulfill. And all it takes is to lesser yourself, humble yourself in the sight of God. And, and, and say that, okay, your plan, your purpose is greater than anything that I could devise. So if we are people who believe that we are our, our own authority, that we can lead our own homes, our own way, it's going to be hard to come to God who says, I'm over it all. You, you have a problem with authority? I am the authority. I am the one that controls all things that you see. So it's crucial that, and I started with husbands and wives because this is a very crucial area in the world. A marriage is not held to a great high respect. I can uh, go back and, and go to these stories that I've been told just about where I live, about how there was this fear of God through the land, <laughs> through uh, the area. that People feared God. The churches were full. But then I also learned that the homes were being ran like what? The way God wanted them to be ran. 
So they understood what authority was. They understood what leadership was. They understood what submissiveness was. And so when it came to God, they were more apt to be that way to him. But I've also been told how the older generation can witness. They are eyewitnesses to the fall of the home. Fall of the way God has intended the home to be. I have heard many say, that's not the way God wants it to be. And what do we see now? We see how many people are defying against God. It really, it does start in the home. It is so crucial that the home is ran the way God wants it to be. And if you see that, I'd say 99% of the time you have a great outcome in relationship with that individual and with God. So 1 Corinthians chapter um, 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Just to clarify, we'll start here in verse 1 because I like dealing with verse 1. This is good with uh, men and women that are dating. I've talked to Carter and Ty about this many times. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Isn't that great words to live by? You think these high schoolers and college need to understand this? Yeah. I think some married men need to understand this and married women need to understand this. Not to your wife or to your husband, but to someone who is not yours. It is crucial to understand uh, the pre-marriage and the beginning of marriage, the middle, the end, whatever it may be. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, that's why we don't do this, because it will lead you to do something you'll regret. Let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. So what words to live by? Yet, What's the belief system today? I think we can all understand clearly that this is not the standard of marriage today. And again, it goes back to that we are free-thinking human beings. We can do what we please, but understand if you do believe in God, God has a desire for you and something for you to believe. So let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her. Likewise, also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Now, I could stop here, and I could make it out to be that I'm some big macho man, and I rule my house with an iron fist, but continue reading. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. There is a mutual respect in the home. The husband and wife need to understand that. And if you've been married for 30, 40 years and you don't know this, you need to get to know this because your marriage will be so much better. Instead of fighting on who's in control, we need to understand how God has put it in order. I do not have authority over my own. My wife does not of hers. We are now what? One. We are concerned about one body, and that is our marriage. It is one. It is no longer two. We are one. Joined together with something that says that God, that man cannot separate. It is a union that I believe is so high, and that's why he uses it to style the church the same way. He could have used a boss and the employees. But what did God use to explain the church? Every time. Marriage. Marriage is not something that is thrown around. Oh, let's not be worried about it. Oh, let them get married. It doesn't matter. It does matter. Because a marriage, a bad marriage can end in you going to hell. Right or wrong? That's right. That's a true statement. If you're in a state of adultery for your rest of your life, you will not go to heaven. The Bible's clear that adulterers will not enter the kingdom of God. So when, when you are, some of you are thinking, well, I got kids. Well, you're going to have grandchildren, hopefully. And those grandchildren, you're going to love and you're going to adore. You're going to snuggle. You're going to hug. You're going to play. You're going to hide things from their mom and dads, whatever it may be. But you're going to train them because it's going to be of your nature to train them grain babies up. Well, when they get to that age where they're trying to get married, they're picking out spouses, it's crucial to teach them what God wants them to have. Because marriage, again, is not something you can just go back to the store and say, ah, I want another one. This one didn't work out. What's the return policy? That's not how marriages work. 
Because if that's the case, then I can just leave the church anytime I want. Oh, I don't want the church. I'll be back. I'll find something different. That's not how it works. Marriage is not something that you just throw out and say, I didn't like that. It didn't work out. He was just a little ugly. He kept putting his shoes on the wrong side. I don't know. I just don't like them. Gone. That's not how marriage works. Marriage is held to such a high standard that God, out of all things that he created, out of everything that he spoke into existence, he chose marriage to use that to explain the way the church works. So marriage needs to be up here. And the way it's ran needs to be up here. It's crucial to understand these simple things. It's not hard. Man makes it difficult. Man makes it very hard to understand how things work. God has made it so simple. So simple that a crazy man can understand the gospel. Someone who is crazy can understand the gospel. Now, lastly, because I can't just pick on can't just pick on the married people, we gotta go to the children. I've met so many people that have told me, I wish I could do it over. I wish that I could teach my kids what I know now. Okay, if you are in that position, you don't, don't raise your hand, you don't have to talk to me about it, but if you're in that position where I wish I could have redone it, I, I, I'm praying for them, they're not right with God, they're not right with, man, I wish I could redo it. Because don't you learn things later in life? Yes, you do. You're not going to know everything. I, I don't know everything there is to know about marriage, about families. Uh, there are things that you learn outside of the Bible that I may have not learned yet. But I'm making sure that I do know what's in the scriptures. I make sure I know that. But there are going to be some things, some advice that some man may give me that's not scriptural advice, but it's great physical advice. I may not learn that 10, 15 years to now. Who knows? But I do want to know everything that God wants me to know in the scriptures. Because that's what's crucial. So... It's going to be hard for me to do this next part to you because I'm this age, my children are this age, you're that age, and your children are this age. So it's kind of hard sometimes to, to talk to people who say, well, my kid is older than you. It's hard for me to give you parenting advice. But my parenting advice obviously is rooted where? It's rooted in the scriptures. So you may say, okay, my kids are grown, but if you have grandchildren, hey, Here's a chance to help with the raising, because I am not against grandparents, you know, giving that advice to their kids. Obviously, it's not their place to raise them, raise them, but it is their place to be there for a spiritual guidance, because Timothy had his mother, and who else? His grandmother. And Paul gave praise to his mom and his grandma for the way Timothy turned out. So I'm not saying that a grandparent cannot teach their grandchildren but it is not your duty to raise raise them like their mom and dad unless you are in that situation where you have to so Ephesians chapter 6 okay so is it not true that let's say I'm going to pick on people that are about 16 years old I don't know a lot of 16 year old but I've seen just enough and I've talked to enough parents to know enough about 16-year-olds. And if you're 16 here, I'm not talking about you specifically. I think we could agree that we could just sum it up and say majority. There are, unless, unless something's changed, uh, even my age. So we'll go from 27, so I'll pick on myself, down to 16 years old, around that age. There's, a, there's, a, there's an area there, especially college age, that mid-college age, where authority is a big problem. Where, where when laws are being passed, where uh, maybe the dean of the school, superintendent of the school, whatever maybe, makes a change, there's a lot of people that have an issue with authority. And so they lash out, whether they, they're protesting, whether it be peaceful or violent protest. Uh, they'll make sure if the authority says you can't do this, well, they're going to run to their mom and dad, and they're going to try to get that person fired. That's a big deal right now. Oh, you ain't going to have a job when I'm done with you. That's your, that's your end result is to ruin that person's life because you got mad at them. That's what's happening. I mean, that's the, the first go-to is how do I get this person fired? 
Instead of going in there, hashing it out like a true man, a true woman, it's, I'm going to get you fired. I'm not going to talk to you face to face. I'm going to get you fired. So we have this hardship with authority. Now, has that always been there? Yes. There's obviously been a time in every generation where somebody didn't like the authority. But because I am alive to see it, it seems like it's more than any other time. There's a lot more rebellion. There's a lot more lashing out. So how could we get, like, my children, my six-year-old, my three-year-old, and one-year-old, how do you think I could get them to start to respect those who are in charge? Where do you think it's going to start? With me and my wife, with their father and their mother. Or dad. We don't use father. It's weird. Dad and mom. That's where it starts. Let's look to the facts. Ephesians 6, verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this, this is right. So you may say this morning, I didn't get to do that. I didn't get to raise my kids this way. Okay, well, there's a lot of kids in this world. We've got a lot of teachers here, and I admire our teachers. I don't know how you do it without not just, bam, smacking and thumping, but you do it. And, and I'm not the biggest public school fan because there's a lot of bad influences running through the halls. But I admire and respect teachers greatly. My dad is a teacher, and I have a great respect for him and any teacher in here. And anybody that deals with kids, you on my respect list, <laughs> you're way up here because you play such a vital role because I know with teachers – they will come to you and confide in you about things that they will never tell your, their parents. So you have the, this opportunity to say, well, here's some book, chapter, and verse. Because most Christians that are teachers, ah, they ain't going to care about teaching. The God. They're going to teach it. If they get the opportunity, they're going to shed some religious and spiritual insight somewhere, some way. No matter what the curriculum says, they're going to pass down this good and healthy knowledge. So... Where does it start with children? It starts in the home. Verse 2, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And your fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. My favorite topic to talk about, and will probably will always be, is the home. It is, it is so near and dear to me, because I love the thought of family. I love the thought of someone being there for you, no matter the situation you may be in. And I've expressed my love of the family of the church and how this family of the church is far greater than my blood family. It has more physical and spiritual value than my blood family. It is so important that we understand this. But if we want the pews to continue to grow, because I know of some places, and I think and I've talked about this before, even Kenya knows of some places, let's say here in about 20 years, they won't be there. There are no kids in the pews. There's no one to take over the song lead. There's no one to take over leading the prayer because the kids are long gone. In 20 years, there I know of two congregations that will not exist. They'll just be an empty building. And I bet they regret not being stern and strict with the raising. So if I raise them, will I not have a better chance of them being submissive to God? Because they've learned submissiveness. They've learned how to obey. Would they not be more apt to obey God? Instead of saying, you can do whatever you want, when you want, I don't control your life, I'm your best friend, I'm going to do these things with you. Oh, and there's a God that rules this earth. You need to be submissive. And they're raised in this home of non-submissiveness, non, uh, no authority. I can almost guarantee you it's going to be hard for them to be under Christ. So, why am I saying all this? I'm saying this because I love and cherish my family. I want, especially want me and my wife to be on the same religious page. I want me and my children to be on the same religious page because I want the kingdom to grow. 
And I believe in order to do that, we need to understand first about authority, about that there is someone in charge. Because even in the physical, we have a hard time with that. Romans chapter 13 teaches us to be obedient to those that are in authority. We have a, a, a state trooper in here that can testify that there are a lot of people that don't like him because he's a cop. And it's not because, well, we take that back. It's not because he's a cop. It's because they got caught doing something that they were doing wrong. And I can probably guess that about 90% of the people he may pull over are pretty negative. Now, I don't know this for sure. I'm just taking a wild guess that a lot of people don't like being pulled over. They don't like getting a ticket. And when they do, they may say something uh, pretty spiteful to the person that gave it to them. There's not a lot of people that say, oh, I love having someone in charge. I love someone telling me what to do. I love rules and regulations. You know, in what I do for a living, I don't like rules and regulations. There's, a, there's this company called OSHA that have literally the dumbest rules in the world. I could not wear a cutoff shirt because this little sleeve was supposed to save me from getting my arm cut off. What kind of rule is that? And I walked around the job site like that, and I just had them rolled up. It was a hot day. We were in hot springs. The welders, they were welding downward, so nothing was falling on. They had cut off sleeves. I thought, oh, I can roll mine up. Next thing I know, my foreman gets a call from my boss and says he just got fined because I had my sleeves rolled up. That's a dumb rule. But what is it? It's a rule. It's a regulation. And anybody that works for me, if we show up to a job site, our sleeves are going to be where? Down. <laughs> Though it may be silly, it's a rule. And it's crucial that we understand as parents, as husband and wife, as father and mother to the children and to those in the community, that we understand authority. Because it will really help us grow closer to God when he's saying, you need to do this, this, and this. So, I encourage you, along with myself, because obviously I am not a perfect human being. I fall short in this, in this area of being submissive. I do not like rules from time to time. Have I broke rules? Yes, I have. We all can sit here and say I broke a rule and you can remember the day. But what I want us to do this morning, like I always want you to do, is take time, because we've been given this amazing moment, we've been given this time uh, from God to think about ourselves. And that's what I want you to do. I want you to think about yourself, your relationship to your wife, your relationship from wife to husband, your relationship to your children. I don't care if they're grown. You're still their parents. Think about your relationship with them and then your grandbabies. And think about how can I be better submissive, better serving to those who are over me? How can I be better serving to God who is over all? And if you're not in a position where you are of Christ, well, that's an area that all those who are my brothers and sisters here this morning will encourage you to consider it. Con consider believing in Christ and the things that he has ready to give to you. All spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1 says, is found in Christ. And I want you to be a part of that. I want you to be able to grab hold of that and take advantage of it. And it's not hard. It's not some... Uh, great task that God has asked you. It is something that is simple. And it starts with believing. And I want you just to take time and think, do I even believe in God? And if you are struggling with that, I would love to talk and discuss with you, whether it be up here or somewhere else. If you don't want to confide in me, find somebody else. Find someone to talk to you this day and leave here knowing like I mentioned every Sunday, leave here knowing that you are with Christ, that you are with God. And if God forbid something happen, that you'll be with him. That's my desire for you. I want you to take advantage of it. And come now together we stand and sing. And Brother Dale will lead this song.